It is good to, uh, to see you back in the sanctuary this morning. Uh, our crowd is growing, and so some of our snowbirds are getting back in town. It's good to see them back and see their smiling faces, and, and it's good to see people coming together again. Um, Steve Budjack shared this morning that it is uh, that just a little over a third, 37%. 37% of people across all age groups are not willing to come out in public yet. Wow. That's one in three. One in three. And so we need to pray for those people, be encouraging to those people, get on the phone, call them. Uh, that is a decision that they're making and that is fine. Uh, but they're obviously frightened, they're concerned and that that is just that's okay but we need to lift one another up in prayer so it is good to have folks back in our sanctuary it is good to see that uh, that our online congregation is growing we had some more people subscribe this week and uh, they are getting a blessing out of it and uh, so like i shared with the congregation here during our announcement time that if you get this email which if you're watching this video you did hopefully or you're following us on uh, on YouTube or Facebook but uh, if you get the email forward that to your to your family and friends and just get that out there and invite them 
uh, to just uh, sign on to, to become part of our online congregation, we would love it. So it is good. God is doing some really, really neat things, and I'm excited about it. Today we start a new series called Chameleon. Now, this is not a gecko, <laughs> okay? We live in Florida. Uh, those little brown little monsters that run all over the place, I had a friend of mine that calls them Jurassics. Doesn't use the word gecko, they're little Jurassic Parks is what she calls them, because they're miniature dinosaurs, and she hates them. She cannot stand these geckos, and, uh, and I actually picked one up the other day uh, at work. It was a tiny little thing. It was just a little bitty guy, and I caught him in my office, and I had him on my hand, and I took him outside, and I held my hand open, and it was, it was kind of cool that morning, and that little guy didn't want to come off of my hand, so he's there on my thumb. And so I took out my phone, took a picture of him, and sent that picture to my friend with a little note that says, thinking of you. <laughs> thinking of you. So we're not talking about geckos, we're talking about chameleons, and the title of this message is Do Not Conform. You kind of get the idea where we're going to be going over the next few weeks. This is a four-week series. And so if you're keeping count, yes, that's the big picture. It's four weeks. Um, I'm not going to give you how many points in the sermon, but we'll just, we'll just let that go right there. <laughs> the world, you see, has certain patterns to it that do not lead to a full life. True or false? Yeah. That's true, isn't it? Greed, anger, jealousy, materialism, dishonesty... All of those things are just a few of the things that the world sees as an everyday pattern. And quite honestly, a lot of the folks in the world see no problem with living that type of lifestyle. As a matter of fact, they expect to see that type of lifestyle. Isn't that a grim fact when you hear that? Paul instructs us in the book of Romans to no longer conform or blend in with the ways of the world, but instead we are to live as transformed people. Now transformation doesn't happen by accident. It is an intentional way of living our lives day by day. If we had a prayer this morning, it would be, God, I have been guilty of creating patterns in my life that do not lead to the full life you want me to live. Help me to get rid of the unhealthy patterns and to substitute them with healthier ones. Transform me into the child of God that I was designed to be. If we had a prayer, that should be our prayer. The story is told about a young 16-year-old Salvation Army officer who was walking to the church from his house for a Bible study one day. In those days, soldiers wore uniforms to every church function. If you were active duty and you went to church, you wore your uniform. This was a Salvation Army soldier. En route to the church, there were 12 or 15 of his peers hanging outside the pool hall that he had to walk past to get to the church. His classmates laughed at him as he walked by. They used choice language and threw rocks. But he stood out because he didn't subscribe to the norms. He didn't fit the standard image, style, or purpose of the world and he chose a different pathway for his life. What about this chameleon? What do we learn about this peculiar little animal that has some very unique features? Number one, his eyes operate independently. If you ever look at a video of a gecko, he can look two different directions at the same time. His eyes 
operate independently. But the really cool thing, I mean, if my eyes did that, that wouldn't be a cool thing. <laughs> People would look at me and say, which one do I look at when I'm talking to him? <laughs> but, <laughs> but one of the really interesting things that these little guys can do is they can change color to blend in with their background. they're setting on something green they can turn green if they're setting on something pink they can turn pink I've always wondered what would happen if they'd ever find themselves setting on a calendar <laughs> I don't think they're quite that talented but no matter what environment it's placed in it will change its color to disguise itself and fit in now remember that one of the fundamental aspects of being a Christian is that we are easily identifiable when placed against the backdrop of the world or we should be we naturally should stand out like the young soldier in the story however the truth is that for many of us we would rather blend in with the crowd than stand out because we don't want to be ridiculed teased or tormented we're going to be looking at a very clear statement from the Bible regarding this topic of ours. This passage really can be a theme verse, if you will, for this whole series. And we start looking at Romans 12, 2. Now, all of these passages will pop up on your screen if you're watching online. And the folks here in the sanctuary, you have it written there in the bulletin. Romans 12, 2 says this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now in this sentence alone, Paul shows us the contrast that we're going to try to unpack today in our time together. And that's this. Fitting in versus standing out now every one of us know full well how important it is to fit in it can feel like the only way to maintain a good number of friendships is by conforming and fitting in with them with their personality their habits and you kind of adapt what you do and say in order to fit in with them the upside is that if you conform and fit in, you can begin to form a sense of community that you may never have experienced before. That's not a bad thing to feel like you're part of something. There's nothing wrong with that. The downside is that you'll be experiencing a false sense of community. Because you're doing it, you're performing it, you're living it out, in order to work your way in with them and you've heard this from me before and it bears repeating if you have friends that are not Christians if you have friends that are pre-Christian we'll say they don't go to church they're not a person of faith either your life will have a positive impact on them or their life will have a negative impact on you There is no neutrality in relationships. I mean, husbands and wives find that they finish each other's sentences. <laughs> Sometimes the husband gets his sentences finished a little more often than he'd like, but that's okay. <laughs> and husbands sometimes cut their wife off, which is never a good thing. But when you're in relationships, you become like the people that you spend time with. And like I've already said, it can be good and it can be bad. The only reason that you are accepted is because you're pretending. Once others discover who you really are, they may leave, they may not. But either way, trust me when I tell you that the whole process can be traumatizing. Because whether you like it or not, 
if you've pretended to be something to them that you're really not just so you can be part of the group and they find out that that's not really who you are your credibility just went out the window and they will not know from that time on whether or not you can be trusted it is always the best thing always listen always the best thing to be genuine with people be who you are be honest and upfront with people live your Christian life out in the world and don't be ashamed as Christians we are called to be like Christ treat others like Christ and interact with the world like Jesus would have done right if we say we are Christians and continue living like everyone else we are what hypocritical you may have an entire friend group that knows nothing of your faith or who you are in Christ they may not even know that you would go to church anywhere these are false communities who will only like us for who we are pretending to be now God is calling us as followers of Christ to stand out not to fit in and it's not an easy process but it is an incredibly important one some of the questions that we're going to be tackling throughout this series are these brace yourself what does conforming look like what are the patterns we as humans are tempted to conform to what does true transformation look like in our lives by Jesus definition oh then once we know what transformation looks like what's the purpose behind it those are some tough questions so we must first get a grip on what conforming looks like in our world the word conform means to assume a similar outward form or expression by following the same pattern mold or model that's the dictionary definition in our friendships and relationships and under the guise and under the the umbrella of peer pressure it also means being pressed into compliance or familiarity pressed with that in mind here's the first point of the sermon confront your conforming confront it I wonder how many of us have tried to model our behavior after someone that we looked up to or admired as you grew up it's almost like you try on the personality or characters that we liked or we admired I won't even go into all of the detail of me wearing a blue bath towel <laughs> and running around the yard with my hands out in front of me humming dun da da dun da da dun da da I didn't even have a shirt with a big red S on it but in my mind I was Superman but what happens when those patterns and behaviors grow up with you and they become your habits and characteristics what if you admire someone so much that you want to be like them and even when their life hits the skids you follow right in line what happens what if you don't like them what if you don't like who you have become then there has to be a confrontation nobody likes confrontation and yet if we are going to confront our conforming there's going to have to be a confrontation with yourself now it can happen in a multitude of different ways externally internally but as believers we can expect that we will at different times in our lives be confronted with the truth of God when we are confronted a change needs to take place am I right when God points something out in our life we have a choice to either follow it or not we have to make a decision 
So I want us to take a look here for just a moment with John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. Yes, it's lengthy, but after we finish reading it, you tell me where I could have sliced anything out. John 4, 1 through 26 reads this way. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give him will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I will never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshiped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way, for God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Jesus, then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah, God's Word. You see, in this passage, Jesus has an encounter with this woman at the well. The cultures clashed. She questioned him. She picked his brain. Notice how when Jesus pointed out her condition, she changed the subject. Did you see that in the text? Well, you've had five husbands and the one you're living with now isn't your husband. Well, why do you Jews have such a problem with where you worship? <laughs> How did she make that leap? <laughs> but Jesus comes right back around and speaks to her need. And he doesn't care about social norms and taboos. He is interested in the redemption of all humankind and he's speaking to this woman because he knows she's lost. Speaks to her at a well while she's drawing. Usually women came to the well much later in the day instead of that particular time of day, but she probably came when no one else was around because she was embarrassed or ashamed. 
But it doesn't matter why she came or how she felt. Jesus meets her and offers her living water. Jesus called out the way that she is living in order to offer her a better way of life found only in himself. Sometimes our lives lived out in the world puts the world on notice that the, of what they're doing and the way they're living is wrong. And no matter how you slice it, it's going to be a stark contrast between a life lived for Christ and the way the world's living. So you see the path to deep transformation has to begin with confronting the negative worldly patterns in our lives. Now we're not talking about confronting the world yet. That's where your mind already went, wasn't it? You were already thinking, how am I going to be able to confront the world? The pastor wants me to go out and face the world. Folks, we're talking about us. We're talking about us. Must, this must be a time of confronting the negative worldly patterns in our lives before we ever begin to look to the world has to happen in our lives first woman at the well happened in an actual encounter where she was at maybe Jesus is trying to call out things in your life that bring no eternal value maybe you've been following the patterns of those around you because it's just a whole lot easier to fit in than to stand out maybe you know that you can keep friendships if you just fit in and follow someone else's lead maybe Jesus is offering you a better way of life here and now and just like his encounter with the woman at the well he's making the same offer to us this morning that here's living water Here's something that can make a difference. And you can be transformed. But there has to be the answer to a question, which is the second point. Do you want to get well? Do you want to have your life honed, recreated, transformed into one like Jesus? Which brings us to John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And it reads this way. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, <clears throat> near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda, with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath day, so the Jewish leaders objected. Another amazing passage. Now in this story, Jesus meets this man who had been an invalid for 38 years, laying at the pool of Bethesda. Now in, actually, in all actuality, I want you to realize something here. I've been to the pool of Bethesda. And some of you have as well. It's not a large place, really, all things considered. But considering the layout, in order for Jesus to get to this particular man, he would have probably had to walk past a lot of other people that needed to be healed as well. So what was so special about this one man? Why didn't Jesus just heal everyone at the pool that day? If you're waiting for an answer from me, I don't have it. I'm stumped. 
I don't have the answer to that question. But I do know this. Obviously, it was time for this man to confront his conforming. Here's why I say that. Don't you think that sometime within that 38 years, instead of just mingling in with the crowd of all the rest of folks that had a problem, don't you think that somehow he could gradually scoot his way to the edge of the water? Don't you think he could move a little closer to the answer? Maybe in order for him to get closer to the water, he had to move away from other people like him. And he would rather conform and intermingle with those people than to find healing and have to go out into a world that he hasn't known for 38 years and start making new friendships and relationships. Could it be? Mm. I don't know. But Jesus confronts him here at the pool. It says when Jesus saw him lying there and realized he'd spent a long time in this condition, he asked him, do you want to get well? <laughs> Wow. What Jesus was looking at was a man who had fully conformed to his circumstances. The handicapped man was discouraged, obviously. Who wouldn't have been? Himself. He himself could not see a pathway to healing. Yet he wanted to be well. And yet didn't see a way out. All he could see was the obstacles. He couldn't see the solution. Little did he know that while he was staring at the pool of water in front of him, the living waters of Christ were staring into his soul, looking to bring healing and wholeness into his life on that particular day. Notice, Jesus doesn't put him in the water. He heals him without the water. So the same question that Jesus asked over 2,000 years ago is still relevant today. Do you want God in your life? Do you want to get well? Do you want the transformative power of God in your life? Which brings us to the final point. The world conforms while the Word transforms. The words of Christ challenged and confronted the man at the pool of Bethesda just like the words of Christ continue to challenge and confront us today. You cannot read the Bible and not feel that you're being confronted. <laughs> There's so much in there. You read anything out of that book and it's going to speak to you because it's a living document. So much of the messaging that you hear in life is inviting you to conform to a worldly image. I only need to say one word to just set your minds free and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about with worldly impression. And here's the word. Are you ready? Commercials. <laughs> right? Yes. Commercials. You can be prettier. You can, your hair can look better. Your face can look better. You can lose weight. There's just amazing things. They don't promise you you can leap tall buildings in a single bound, which was really where I was headed as a youngster. <laughs> Never made it. I did try jumping off the chicken coop one time, sprained my ankle. I did fly from the roof to the ground. It was that landing that was tough. But commercials... All of the advertising around us, not just what's on television and on social media, but billboards are all designed to get your attention and make you desire what the world is offering. That's just the way advertisement works. So much of the messaging that you hear in life is inviting you to conform to a worldly image that falls far short of the glory of God. You deserve better, they say. You deserve more. You deserve this, bigger, better, blah, 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 blah. 
The messaging of the Bible, however, invites you into the transforming power of God. The world conforms, the word transforms. If you are here or listening today and you're trying to figure out why the negative pattern in your life seems to be present, maybe it has a correlation to the time that you spend with God in His Word, you think? If you're saying, my life isn't being transformed, I don't see transformation happening in my life. When was the last time you sat down with the Word of God and really allowed it to speak to you? Because I will guarantee you, you cannot spend time with the Word of God and not be changed. It will speak to you every time. Whether you've got a preacher there, whether you've got an evangelist there, whether you've got somebody leading singing there, it does not matter. I can give you story after story, hundreds of stories of people in hotel rooms that picked up a Gideon Bible and accepted Christ as their personal Savior without any sermon at all. Why? Because the Word of God spoke to them. The world around us will gladly give us things to fill our time, and before you know it, we will have not spent any time with God. The more time that we spend with God, the more we will begin to look like His Son, Jesus. Because in conforming to Christ, we are transformed to be like Christ. Let me remind you of Romans chapter 12, verse 2 again. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Like I said, it could be a theme verse. Our minds are the most powerful supercomputers in the world, and they are hardwired to store and recall all the information that you take in throughout a lifetime. Do you know that everything you've ever learned, everything you've ever heard, everything you've ever said is right here? You just can't remember it all. <laughs> but it's there. It's there. Maybe it's time for a bit of rewiring regarding the filling of our mind. Each of us needs spiritual and mental renewal, and God's Word is the source of what we are seeking in our heart and life. Anytime, any place, God is ready to meet you right where you are, to take you where He wants you to be, and to be the person to be transformed and renewed by His power, not your own. So here's some questions. I always like questions. <coughs> questions to consider. Do you want to be healed? Do you want the transformative power of God in your life? Do you want the abundant life that Christ refers to in John 10.10? 10? Look it up. <laughs> Renewing your mind, being transformed, not conforming to the world around you. These things, folks, I'll be honest with you, they are not easy, but they're worth it. You can look all around you to discover how to fit in and look like everyone else, act like everyone else, such and such. However, you must look up and within to learn the art of standing out for Christ. It's up to you. So to give you some questions to take with you, here they are. What is God trying to do in your heart as we begin this series together? What kind of self-reflective journey do you need to embark on this week to take steps toward that transformation? And what needs to happen in your daily routine to make room for the Word of God? God desires to see you transformed. The tough question is, do you really want it? And do you want to be healed by the power of God in your life? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the faithfulness of it. Every one of us in this place, online, every one of us can admit that more often than not, we conform. 
By faith this morning, O oh God, we are all asking you to transform us. Help us to see the need to spend some time with you and allow you to speak to our hearts. Move in our midst. Help us to be that medium, that catalyst to transform the world around us, even if it's one person at a time. Give us your grace. Give us your strength and move upon us in powerful ways, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.